This is 50 Feminist States, a road-tripping storytelling podcast visiting all 50 U.S. states to interview feminist activists and artists about their work for gender justice. I'm Amelia Freeby, and this week, we're in Alabama. From the glaciers of Alaska to the dunes of Indiana, I want 50 feminist states. From the waves of New Hampshire to skies of Montana, I want 50 feminist states. And when you hear the call, you know so well, sister. Hi everyone, Amelia here. Welcome back to the 50 Feminist States podcast season three. This week we are in Alabama. This is our second very special episode from Alabama. And for this one, we're in Montgomery. Today, I am very excited to be doing 50 Feminist States very first crossover episode. So while I was in Montgomery, I spoke to Adrienne Vandervalk of Feminist Hot Dog Podcast, which is a news, humor, and cultural survival podcast. I love that tagline. By, for, and about women and people of all genders who experience sexism. So on her podcast, Adrienne talks to people of all ages, races, classes, genders. Like this, She takes this really intersectional approach to who we need to hear from about feminism. And I love listening to her episodes. Um, she does these really great segments. She asks people what makes their feminist hearts sing. She asks them to add someone to the Feminist Hot Dog Hall of Fame. So it's a really fun podcast to listen to. And I was so excited that when I went there to interview Adrienne, we recorded an episode for 50 Feminist States interviewing her. And she recorded an episode for Feminist Hot Dog interviewing me. So go ahead and head over to Feminist Hot Dog. You can find it on any podcast listening platform that you're on, subscribe, find a new episode, learn a little bit more about my work with 50 Feminist States. And of course, stay tuned here to learn about what Adrienne is doing with Feminist Hot Dog. So coming up today, you're going to hear Adrienne talk about her work with the podcast, also about a very exciting book that she has coming out next year that I am so pumped about. We'll learn a little bit about what brought her to Montgomery, Alabama and why she stayed. And she'll tell us a little bit more about some of the really inspiring feminist legacies in Montgomery and Alabama that she's learned about since living here and that I think we could all used to learn about as we lead our feminist lives. So I'll go ahead and let Adrienne introduce herself. You'll be able to hear our conversation and then I'll chime back in as usual at the end with a few other updates. Thanks so much for tuning in. Here's Adrienne now. So my name is Adrienne Vandervalk and right now we are in Montgomery, Alabama, which is I think considered sort of South Central Alabama and a lot of people who uh, live in this region say that they know Montgomery because it's the city that they drive through on the way to the beach. It is also the capital city of Alabama. What brought you to Montgomery? How did you, how long have you been in Alabama? How did you land here? I moved here in 2013 to work for the Southern Poverty Law Center and I was at SPLC for about six years. Uh, I'm no longer there, but I, while I was here, I really ended up building a life that I wasn't expecting to when I first moved down here. Um, I came on my own as a single person without children, and I have really found a nice community here. I got married to a man who is from Alabama, which also was an unexpected twist to my story. And so, you know, even though I'm my employer is actually now in California, I'm uh, here for the foreseeable future. This is my home. The big question that I want to talk about today is like, what is it like to be a feminist in Alabama, I guess in Montgomery or this region of Alabama specifically? And so maybe we can start with like, how did it feel when you first moved here and what has kind of grown and evolved over the past I guess, six or so years that you've been here? Well, one of the things that I noticed when I got here was that a lot of the people that I met in my day-to-day -day life were very friendly, very kind, really inquisitive. Um, they didn't really know what to do with me when they met me. Um, and because I am, you know, at that point I was a single woman without, uh, not a mother, um, in my late thirties and that, um, elicited some questions from people. Um, and I think some just curiosity, cause uh, I think that that's not, the, not necessarily the norm here, um, broadly speaking. 
Uh, of course, there are many, many, many exceptions. And I was also struck by um, the role that religion plays in the culture here. And I, I just saw a statistic that said that I think 86% of Alabama citizens or residents ascribe to some type of Christianity, not, not just religion, but Christianity specifically. And, uh, that's, I found that to be the case. And so I moved here from Portland, Oregon by way of Denver, Colorado. And that was just a big shift for me personally. Um, feeling like religion was suddenly very much part of my day-to-day interactions with people, both in terms of being asked where I went to church, being, um, having people, um, bless me, you know, in a really sincere way as part of very sort of transactional conversations, you know, at the grocery store or the coffee shop, you know, whatever. And I think, uh, you know, I've met people here, you know, other folks who have moved here who find that really off-putting and, and offensive. Personally, I find it very sincere and very nice um, because I do think it's coming from a sincere place. But I compartmentalize that from, you know, from my larger beliefs about some of the harms that religiosity has done politically and socially here in in Alabama which you know we can talk about that too but so those are two things that I noticed just that my identity was was unusual and also because I'm I don't practice any organized religion that that also um, kind of set me apart from um, from many of the people I was interacting with on a day-to-day basis how does that religiosity affect the political landscape here? And I can say too, I grew up in North Carolina. I'm in a very small town. It seems like everyone was religious. It's just such a part of culture and you really are known for where you go to church. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like your relationship with your pastor or priest is like supposed to be the utmost relationship in your life. And so I'm intrigued to hear from your perspective, like, How does that deep religiosity impact politics and maybe more specifically like the role of of women or your experience as a woman here? Um, Well, I will say that I've been really struck by the lack of separation of church and state. Even so, Alabama famously passed this hyper restrictive abortion bill earlier this year, and it was signed into law in May, I believe. And even... In the tweet that Kay Ivey's, Governor Kay Ivey's office sent out when she signed the bill, um, said something to the effect of this recognizes Alabama's fir- firm commitment to the belief that um, all life is sacred and a gift from God. I mean, and this is in a an official correspondence from the governor's office, right? So, I mean, that's a very strong statement. That is not just somebody blessing you at the grocery store. That's the, you know, the governor of Alabama saying the Christian beliefs of the Alabama legislature are going to trump the U.S. Constitution here, you know, in this, in this case. And I've had a number of conversations with people about whether this was a sort of a stunt or a statement or whether it really was a tactic designed to, you know, escalate this case Ideally, in the eyes of the anti-choice movement, all the way up to the Supreme Court, in the in the hopes that one you know one of these bills will be the one that ends up challenging Roe versus Wade. So, I don't know. Um, I'm not an expert on legal strategy, so I can't necessarily comment on that. But I have been really struck by that. Another example is you know at, as the end at the end of this month, this month being August, Alabama will no longer issue marriage licenses. So out of I guess respect for the probate judges who do not feel comfortable signing marriage licenses for same-sex couples. Now in Alabama, you, um, you're you issued a certificate, which you then take away and have notarized elsewhere. And then you bring it back to the probate office and it's filed. So it's any anything sort of official goes on sort of outside of the purview of the of the probate judge so that they don't have to violate their you know I'm assuming in 99.99% of cases Christian beliefs about same sex marriage so that you know I think is just another example of again you know that in this state that the idea of separation of church and state does not seem to be a value that that is widely held among our elected officials I will say that I think Alabama and many states in the South get a lot of, and, and earn, you know, they earn a lot of bad press for this kind of thing. But I'm, I, I'm also someone who really wants to uplift the deep 
history of resistance in this state and acknowledge the many, many, many people and groups who do not ascribe to this way of thinking, including many faith-based organizations. So there is a really, there are very active progressive Christians in this state. I think you'd probably be familiar with the Moral Monday movement. There's been um, a contingent of Moral Monday and the Poor People's Movement here in Alabama has has a presence. And just other, you know, uh, other faith-based folks who I would consider feminists and intersectional feminists and who believe in choice and who believe in the separation of church and state. So I really want to make sure to highlight those identities and that work as well, because I think otherwise we really run the risk of kind of writing the South off as being beyond any kind of redemption um, and also completely discrediting some really innovative and important and powerful work that's being done here. I couldn't agree more. What I'm constantly telling like everyone I can get to listen to me is that the most exciting organizing I see happening is happening in the most embattled places, mm-hmm. which are often in the South. Yeah. Like the places that are really entrenched are the ones where they're coming up with ways to resist. And so I'm always just trying to get people to listen to like, don't dismiss these places. Um, we will learn so much from the people resisting there Mm -hmm. that's part of why i like actually travel and come to these places and talk to people so um thank you for putting that so eloquently and i'm excited to only like amplify that um let's go ahead let's go ahead and talk about feminist hot dog sure i really want to know why this podcast has this name (laughs) tell me the story of the name behind this podcast and (laughs) how how you started the podcast um okay so I started Feminist Hot Dog in October of 2018, and the original, so the true origin story of the name, it has sort of evolved, I think it has evolved um, somewhat. I I was actually not watching the Brett Kavanaugh hearings because I felt really sort of, I don't know, that whole scenario was just bothering me on such a deep level, and I just really felt like... um, there was this sort of injustice playing out on the national stage and many women in my cir- um in my circle many people in my circle were watching it and commenting on social media and i just felt this sense of despair i guess coming out of the feeds that i you know that i follow and not that that despair hadn't been there on some level ever since the Trump election or, you know, I, I have a lot of, of really socially active people in my life. So there's there's always kind of a sense of urgency about a variety of issues. But this was really personal. This really just felt like everyone who had ever sort of had an experience um, like what Christine Blasey Ford was describing was really having it kind of confirmed for them that nothing had changed since they were in high school and that you can literally get a PhD and publish books and work for Stanford and be the most, you know, we should believe all survivors, but like couldn't be sort of a more stereotypically like quote unquote credible person. And I, you know, again, sort of recognize how problematic it is to frame it that way and still just have your story be totally dismissed or be accused of mistaking the person who assaulted you for somebody else or, you know, just the whole thing was just so unsettling. And so it really um, made me feel like I just need, I want to do something. I I need to feel good. Um, I want to feel good about my identity because I don't right now. And I want to feel good about being a feminist because right now it just sort of feels like all the feminist urges that I'm having are purely in response to this like bad thing that is happening. And I, I want to kind of think about feminism in a more positive way, you know, you know, um, so all that, that's sort of the or the origin of the podcast, the origin of the name really came from this kind of argument that I was having in my head with Mitch McConnell, who I absolutely detest, um, and really had that driven home for me during that time. And, Um, I just remember watching him on TV and thinking like, this guy doesn't, he in no way understands my life or the life of really any woman or gender nonconforming person or anyone who's ever had an experience like what is being described right now. And he does not, he doesn't represent me at all. And I would rather be represented by a hot dog. Like that just, that like (laughs) phrase 
just popped into my mind. And then I thought, as long as it was a feminist hot dog. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and that just made me laugh. Uh, and I really needed that sort of laughter at that point. And I thought, huh, I wonder what a feminist hot dog is. And it just, the that phrase just sort of stuck with me. And so, the, you know, the more... Um, there are a couple of like related stories. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, Aisley, the dancing hot dog princess who went viral. Yeah. Went viral a, f- a couple of years ago. So she's, um, she sort of reinforced the feminist hot dog idea. And then, um, also just the idea that a hot dog is really sort of an amalgamation of a lot of different things, um, in one. And I have really tried to, on the show, emphasize that they're really, Um, there are kind of some ideological guideposts that I use in my personal feminism, but really feminism is, is so, uh, there's so many different ways to be a feminist and to lead a feminist life. And, um, and I think one of the reasons that people sort of back away and resist feminism is that they have a very singular idea of what that has to mean. And that's limiting in terms of, you know, the value proposition of feminism, you know, it, it can, it can look so many different ways so that, you know, that might be another way to interpret the name. And, um, I don't know, it just, that's just kind of where I landed. I think that that's hilarious and cool. <laughs> um, and I love like using our like political actions to like bring joy into our lives mm-hmm. um, because they are so often like entrenched in struggle and responding to such painful events. Like when we can find those moments of laughter and you just kind of like harness to that and put it in the name of what you're doing, which yep. I think is yep. so cool. Um, so what kinds of people have been on the podcast? What kind of response have you gotten to it? Tell me a little bit about how it's evolved since that first laugh and then decision to start it. Sure. So I didn't know anything about podcasting and I really started off by interviewing my friends mostly. And I'm lucky enough to have um, a friend group that, you know, does a really wide variety of very interesting things and has a lot of different and interesting perspectives. And so it, um, it really just was, at first, just something that we were kind of experimenting with and doing for fun. And I started, I guess, sort of thinking more and more about how to sort of refine some of the um, the goals of the podcast and thinking about, you know, we sort of, I kind of woke up and was like, oh, whoa, we've done 15 episodes. That's That sounds like a season. And so took a little break, came back, um, started season two and season two, I've been um, really trying to reach out and bring in voices of people that I don't know, which I feel like is important for just kind of if we're if we're going to talk about intersectional feminism, really capturing capturing voices that I'm not necessarily going to encounter on on in my day to day life here in Montgomery. So that's been very educational and very interesting for me. So um, kind of along the, you know the lines of what I was saying before about feminism can look so many different ways. Um, You know, I interviewed a woman this last week who is, she lives in England. She was my first international guest and um, she's a model and a fashion blogger, but she's, she, her blog is called Roll and Funky. And that's because she's a wheel, a full-time wheelchair user. And she's also um, a black woman uh, with her roots in Jamaica and she's um, born and raised in London. So that's a perspective. I, you know, would have be very unlikely to find here, but she, you know, I just enjoyed my conversation with her so much and I learned so much. Um, and even just about sort of the differences between ableism in the United States and the UK, you know, which was, which was really educational for me. We, I've had a a number of guests talk about the differences between reproductive rights and reproductive justice, which is something that I was, you know, sort of, peripherally familiar with but have gotten much more um in tune to since um since having those conversations and it really makes me realize like Alabama is a place where reproductive justice is kind of the need for that I guess is really in your face all the time right because you know we have a 10 percent tax on groceries here so feeding your feed, being able to to know that you have the economic stability to feed your child made so much harder by that um, regressive tax. Um, In Montgomery in particular, Montgomery public schools are um, highly segregated 
very poorly performing. So um, do you know that you can, um, you know, give your child a good education here? No, it's not a guarantee here. So that is also, that's a reproductive justice issue, but we don't necessarily think about that um, when we frame our conversations purely in terms of abortion access. So I, you know, I've learned a lot in those regards. Talk, just talk to a lot of people who are doing really different and interesting projects that I, you know, never would have known about before. And I've been so struck by their generosity and, you know, being, being willing to share their stories. And, you know, I, you know, I've learned a tremendous amount myself and it also, it, it, it worked in terms of like the goal, the original goal of the podcast is to kind of help me emotionally and mentally get you know, I'm certainly not over uh, any of the terrible things that I think are happening in our country right now. And I would never say that we should not watch the news or not resist those things. But I really needed to carve out a space for myself to, like, as you said, sort of find, find joy. And doing these episodes and talking to these inspiring women has really done that for me. Women and people of multiple genders, I should add, because I have, I think I originally started off saying women. And then the more that I was learning about intersectional feminism, realizing, well, that's really, that's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about essentially anyone who's not a cis man and needing to be really explicit about that and not just assume that women was an adequate descriptor because it's not. Yeah. I mean, I think even just like those small language shifts do take, they take learning. Mm -hmm. And I always like, I think podcasts can be a great way to learn those things with, um, I mean, learning especially for adults, I think is is scary. And it's hard to not know where to start. And you mentioned before kind of thinking about podcasting as resisting. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. So I think podcasting is unique because in the progressive movement, we talk a lot about voices being at the table or uplifting certain voices. And it's an opportunity to kind of put your money where your mouth is in the, in terms of that, like, I have two microphones. Who's going to speak into the other microphone, right? Um, I could have done a podcast with a, me sort of waxing about feminism every uh, every week. But I, you know, I, I think that I've been very lucky to be exposed to a lot of um, sort of both sort of philosophical and practical training about the value of giving the mic to somebody else. And so, and I think that when, when we do that, it, that, that does, that is a way of resisting the kind of dominant culture and, you know, white supremacist culture and patriarchal culture that might tokenize guests or invite them to say a few words or might, you know, um, summarize what they have to say or, you know, peripherally reference. Um, but I think it's been important to me as, um, as a way to push back against what I see as really oppressive systems to give majority airtime to guests, um, uh, guests from a, from a really wide variety of different backgrounds. So to me, that's like a very, very, very small example of resistance, but I do feel like that's important to me. Um, and just, you know, again, talking about news stories that maybe aren't getting a lot of press, um, talking about personal experiences that might be really uncomfortable or unpopular to talk about (laughs) in other settings and challenging the audience to listen and, and sit with those stories and be aware that that exists. Um, and I think that also being, um, a joyful feminist is, is resistance in, you know, on a certain level. Um, because it, it is outside of, I think the sort of stereotypical beliefs about like feminists being angry, I think is, is the, the, um, and I am angry and I think we have like lots of reasons to be angry, but I also think we have lots of reasons to be really proud of, um, and of, you know, the kinds of resistance that we see happening right now. Um, and I think we have reasons to be self-critical also because white feminism, you know, and I'll draw the distinction between, between being a white person who is a feminist and a white feminist in the sense that where you only center the needs of and the, um, the issues that are relevant to white women. That's a conversation we absolutely need to be having and not just having, I, that's, I don't even like saying it that way. 
Because I feel like that's, again, sort of like rhetoric. Like, oh, yeah, we really need to have this conversation. We really need to change what we're doing and change our behavior and change our attitudes and change our whole like framework in, in terms of the way that we think about feminism. And I've had a number of guests on the show who don't identify as feminists because they feel like the feminist movement has not represented their interests and their identities. I had a couple of guests talk about different points in their lives identifying as womanists and a guest recently who identifies as a liberationist, which I really loved that. So I think all of those things are, because it's not just about resisting patriarchy, it's also about resisting the rigidity within ourselves and question, resisting the forces within, you know, the quote unquote women's movement that are causing us to continue using terms like women's movement, when, <laughs> which is, again, needs to change. And I know that a lot of people disagree with, with that, but I, I do like having the opportunity to use the platform as a, as a chance to dissect that a little bit. No, I think that's great. I mean, I was so impressed when you responded to my email by being like, cool, this sounds good, but like, are you trans inclusive? Because if not, <laughs> then um, I can't do this, <laughs> which yeah, it's like funny a little like when you say it that way, but no one's asked me that. I've done, you know, dozens of interviews at this point and no one is like that clearly like we're either aligned on this or like the feminism we're talking about isn't the is same. not the same, right? And I think that's super important. And it then made me go like put a values little section on the website because I was like, oh, this is super important. And I need to like make it explicit, not just have it live implicitly in these 20 episodes that people can comb through to try to figure out mm -hmm. how I feel about trans mm -hmm. issues. Like I can just say there that it's always trans inclusive and all of the other things I want to make sure I highlight. So yeah, I, I think just recently I've had a number of experiences that really highlighted for me that with both within feminist spaces and within LGBTQ spaces or maybe maybe they're more lgbq <laughs> spaces that there's some trans exclusivity that i previously might have been sort of again intellectually aware of but that you know these experiences really drove home for me like wow this these are folks who claim progressive values and claim sort of liberationist ideology and are completely sort of closed to extending that to a whole group of people who are arguably the most marginalized in this in this culture at this point in time. So, yeah, that's that's a big part of the reason why I said that just because that's it's so well trans people have been saying this forever and you know now like me as like a cis straight white woman I'm like we're excluding trans people. I'm clutching my pearls like but like again recognizing that I have the platform to be able to talk about that um, and to uplift voices of people who, for whom that, you know, that's their experience. Yeah. Tell me what's what's going on in Alabama. What's on your radar as somebody who lives here and things that like the rest of us should know about? Yeah. So one uh, organization that I think is really worth highlighting is the Powerhouse. So the Powerhouse is literally a house that's right next door to the Reproductive Health Clinic here in town. And it's run by the Montgomery Area Reproductive Justice Coalition. And so what I love about this space is when you drive by it, there is no question about the politics um, coming out of that space. It, there are pro-choice signs all over the lawn. There are um, pride flags flying up right next to the American flag. It is a very, um, very visible and very proud space. And so it is the function of the house essentially is like this is where the clinic escort service is run out of. So the pro-choice clinic escorts are trained there. That's kind of their home base. That's where they can go and check in and get their um, get their vests at the beginning of their shifts. Um, the powerhouse also does fundraising for people who don't have enough money to pay for their abortion procedures who might show up at the clinic and be short. Um, they work closely with the Yellow Hammer Fund, which Yellow Hammer Fund got a lot of great press um, when the abortion bill passed and um, and lots of donations, which is great. P please keep them coming. They're very necessary. Um, they provide space and respite for patients and also for the people who accompany patients to the clinic. So if a patient has a baby, for example, and maybe, um, uh, you know, a patient brought their friend or sister or mom um, and they just need somewhere to like change a diaper or let the baby kind of walk around or, you know you could do that over at the powerhouse they don't provide child care but they provide space where you can care for children 
Um, and they're just an unapologetically pro-choice presence in the community and very visible, which I appreciate. And the um, activist who runs the house uh, is named Mia Raven. She's also very visible, very outspoken. Um, and that's a that's a position that's not without risk. I mean, really anywhere in the country, but in Alabama, the anti-choice protest contingent is extremely vicious, um, very well resourced. Um, we have um, clinic protesters who are paid uh, salaries to do what they do here. Um, I always assume that they are armed. I don't, you know, I don't know that, but I just given the um, sort of cultural context, I, you know, I think it's likely and so, yeah, I really wanted to, to give Yellowhammer Fund and Powerhouse a shout out. Um, I also um, wanted to highlight the work of Black Pearl, which is a liberationist advocacy and artist collective out of Birmingham that's doing really interesting things, centering the experiences of Black, Brown, Indigenous, trans, and queer women. Um 1977 Books, which is a liberationist bookstore that's opening here in Montgomery next month, which I'm super excited about and is a beautiful space and um, it's going to be great. The Bayard Rustin Community Center um, and Montgomery Pride United, which uh, does a lot of training and education around LGBTQ issues and also provides space for LGBTQ youth here in Montgomery. And then the last thing I will, there's, you know, of course, very rich civil rights history, which I, you know, that's probably a different podcast, but I do consider that um, to be very influential, you know, to me in terms of my thinking about feminism and activism. Um, and so someone that I wanted to highlight who is, I think, a very a fundamental person in civil rights history who often gets overlooked is Aurelia Browder. Um, so Aurelia Browder was the lead plaintiff in the lawsuit Browder versus Gale, which was the lawsuit that ended transportation segregation in Alabama. Um, so Montgomery is obviously very well known for the Montgomery boy bus boycott, and Rosa Parks is really the face of that story, um, and she certainly played a very instrumental role in that, and the bus boycott was an incredibly important organizing tactic that brought a lot of visibility to the issue of transportation segregation here in the South. But... Um, but Aurelia Browder, as along with four other plaintiffs, or excuse me, three other plaintiffs, Mary Louise Smith, Claudette Colvin, and Susie McDonald, um, were actually the plaintiffs in the lawsuit that was was the the reason that transportation segregation ended. And I think a lot of people don't know that. Um, it's just a, a very buried story because we kind of like simple stories and we like stories about, you know, um, we like the story of Rosa Parks being too tired and, you know, not giving up her seat. And um, all of these women and countless, countless black women in Montgomery had the experience of being forced to give up their seats. And this particular suit was um, brought on the premise that the these four plaintiffs sued the city, Gail being the mayor of Montgomery at the time, under the claim that their 14th Amendment rights and I'm guessing the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, their rights have been violated by the segregationist practices of the city and the bus company. So at the time when they won their lower court case, it was appealed and went to the Supreme Court. And at the time that the Supreme Court upheld the lower court decision of Browder versus Gale, um, the Montgomery bus boycott was really waning. There was a lot, a lot of flagging energy, a lot of resistance on the part of uh, white folks in Montgomery making it you know, shutting down the taxi services and um, being uh, th you know threats of violence for Dr. King and his family and other organizers. It was not a foregone conclusion that the bo the boycott would have worked um, on its own. And of course, it was significant. And like I said, you know, I'm certainly not saying it wasn't a good and important tactic, but it was the lawsuit that almost no, no one knows about. And Aurelia Browder, who you know herself had endured personal threats and had her house attacked and her children threatened, who really changed history in that case. And but no one knows about her. So I just wanted to lift her up, up her story. Her home is actually a museum here in town, and. Um, yeah, so I just shout out to Aurelia and her and her sisters um, for bringing Browder versus Gale. Cool. I didn't know anything about that. Yeah. Awesome. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you wanted to bring up in terms of feminism in Alabama or feminist hot dog more specifically? 
So one last thing that I will mention is that I am publishing a book based on the podcast Feminist Hot Dog. I can't believe I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, so it is scheduled to come out uh, hopefully in the fall of 2020. And it's going to be um, just largely some essays written on many of the narrative themes that have come out of the show and then um, relying a lot on some of the um, the actual interviews that uh, were conducted throughout the first two seasons. So, um, so yeah. And it's going to be published by Lit Riot Press. And so I look forward to bringing that to the world. So cool. Yeah. That's exciting. Thank you. Thanks so much to Adrian for being on the podcast and to Feminist Hot Dog for uh, inviting me to be on one of their episodes. As I said at the beginning, go ahead, search for Feminist Hot Dog in your podcast listening platform. Give them a subscribe, rate and review them. They're really awesome. I love the work Adrian's doing with that podcast. So many wonderful episodes to dig into. Coming up next week, we are headed to Georgia and then Kentucky, and then season three is done, which is wild to think about. That means you only have two more weeks to enter our season-long giveaway. So if you rate and review the podcast on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, you will automatically be entered to win a 50 Feminist States swag pack, tote bag, a fanny pack, some notepads, pens, stickers, all of the 50 Feminist States swag that your heart could desire. So take a couple minutes, please rate and review us on iTunes. And while you're at it, of course, you know, we're on Instagram. We have a newsletter. There are all sorts of ways that you can get more 50 feminist states in your life. Can't wait for more episodes of season three. Until then, we'll see you on the road. tuning in to this episode of 50 Feminist States. You can find show notes at 50feministstates.com slash podcast and follow us on Instagram at 50 Feminist States. Special thanks to Danielle Sines and Jessica Neria for our theme song. Until next time, wild ones, we'll see you on the road.